is low. Sorry. Let me start thanking the organizers for the invitation. And uh, you see the title and the outline of my talk is uh, uh, given here. I will talk mostly about uh, our applications, oh, developments of um, post DFT methods in the last couple of years. I will do uh, short. Um, ah, here. I will sorry. I will give a short uh, introduction. Then we'll talk about uh, MP2 and RPA using the Gaussian and plane wave methods. So that's the basic methods that uh, we are using. And then we'll go to recent developments and if I have time also to some outlook and, and challenges. So of course this was done by many uh, gifted people. Uh, all of this is in collaboration or was in collaboration with Joost van de Wondele. And uh, the most of the work was done by three brilliant uh, PhD students, Manuel Guidon, Mauro Del Ben, and uh, Jan Wilhelm. So what do we want to do? So we want to do liquids and solutions. And we know that after many years of doing water and uh, ions in water and similar systems, there are still some problems with uh, GGA-DFTs and it, the question is, can we go beyond GGA-DFT? Can we use non-local correlation methods and improve for something like, for example, the density of water where we need a balanced description of hydrogen bonding and Van der Waals forces? Uh, another shortcoming that we recently found, uh, or it was uh, um, given to our attention by some uh, experiments at uh, PNNL, that for example the structure of the solvation shell of ions in water is not very accurately described by GGAs. Or for example, of course, well-known level alignment ions in solution at li solid liquid interfaces are uh, problematic for GGAs. So, for example, if you look at the density of water, we all know if you do this for standard GGA functionals, you get a, a too low density. If you add now Van der Waals corrections in some ad hoc manner, you get better densities, but you get a wide spread of densities. Depending on the functional you're using, you typically are between 1 and 1.1 1 .1, uh, grams per cubic centimeters. But you can even have outliers like these uh, Minnesota functionals that are 20% of uh, uh, too dense functional. So is there a possibility to have here much better or, or more predictive values? Another point, as I already said, is ions in water. For example, here this is uh, potassium in water. Uh, if you do PBE D3 or also a hybrid functional PBE zero D3, uh, the peak of the radial distribution function is off by almost half an angstrom. So could this be something that uh, uh, can be done with uh, post uh, artifoc methods or post density functional GGA methods? Another thing, energy levels in liquid water uh, we all know the, the band gap of water and that uh, then uh, is wrongly described in these functionals, also in hybrid functionals, and this then affects also the levels of ions in water. So to do this type of simulations, what we want to do is electronic structure calculations and we want to use non-local correlation because that includes the Van der Waals correction and we hope to have Van der Waals correction and, for example, hydrogen bonding on the same level, so this should add to better accuracy. Of course, if you go to quantum chemistry, there are many methods doing this, but we only want to do the most uh, simple one, so MP2 or direct RPA, maybe in connection with a double hybrid uh, system. Still, it's a challenge because we want to do system sizes that we can do sampling in, uh, for liquid, so at least 200 atoms in the order of 500 correlated atoms 
we are using a Gaussian basis set or a localized basis set, so that means for us in the order of 4,000 basis functions. Because these methods are much more demanding on the basis than uh, uh, GGA functionals are. So we are typically in the order of 4,000 and more basis functions. On the other hand, we want to do liquids, so of course we have periodic boundary conditions, but the gamma point is hopefully enough. So we concentrate of gamma point only calculations. But single, uh, simulations are not enough. We have to do sampling. Sampling can be done either by molecular dynamics or Monte Carlo. These methods are expensive, so you better do the best you can, meaning multiple time step schemes or uh, very accurate bias potentials so that you can get a long way without doing a calculation on the highest level. So we, all, we are in all calculations showing this has been done. Then still we need smooth energy surfaces. So Monte Carlo will not work if you uh, have a rugged energy surface or accurate analytic forces if you want to do MD. So if you dip, uh, have these methods, they have to be analytic. We, don't, uh, we can cut corners, but not all corners can be cut. Still, we need in the order of 20,000 for water. This is now water at ambient temperature. We need in the order of 20,000 energy calculations. So this means 20,000 RPA calculations gives us one density of water. Uh, what does that mean? Nowadays, if you go to praise, you probably get easily, easily from praise, a uh, CPU budget of one million node hours. If you want to use this for this type of calculations and you want to spend it in three months, you don't want to wait too long, and you run on 512 nodes, that means roughly one RPA or MP2 calculations uh, in six minutes. So that's our goal. Now how do we do this? All of these calculations need at some point electrostatic integrals, two electron integral types of uh, occupied times virtual orbitals interacting with the occupied times virtual orbital. Now we use a Gaussian auxiliary basis and an RI approach, resolution of identity or density fitting approach, that these type of integrals are always calculated from uh, this formula here, where we have here three center uh, uh, type integrals, and then here the, uh, the inverse of the Coulomb matrix. This integral is calculated using the Gaussian and plane wave approach, meaning by Fourier transforms. And then these integrals are, can be calculated as um, a tensor contraction over these uh, three index tensors, where the three index tensors themselves are calculated using these GPW integrals, that meaning we are calculating these integrals by putting these functions S, these are our auxiliary bases on the grid, doing an FFT, calculating the real space potential of this orbital and then integrating over the product of two Gaussian functions. This is the GPW approach. We are very good at doing this. Uh, and then calculating this quantity and this quantity then has to be uh, transferred with your molecular orbitals to the BIAS. Once we have this, we can plug this scheme into the MP2 energy. You see you have these type of integrals. Uh, you calculate them using this tensor contraction. That is, in fact, the most expensive part. If you look at it, it's a contraction over the auxiliary basis that makes it an n to the fifth step. So we don't reduce the scaling. We just make it faster. So it's still an n to the fifth step for MP2. The RPA formula given in this form includes the Q matrix, that is a matrix of the auxiliary basis, and it has a tensor contraction over the uh, particle hole states, and this makes it an n to the fourth step, so RPA calculations in this form can be done on n to the fourth uh, steps. 
now applying these methods. So our system, what we are doing is isobaric isothermal Monte Carlo simulations. Uh, liquid water, 64 molecules, 192 atoms. Uh, the basis set for the experts is a correlation consisted triple theta valence basis set roughly 3,500 basis functions. The RI basis is 8,700 basis functions. A little bit on scaling. These methods are very expensive, but they are also very easily to, or rather easily to uh, parallelize. So parallelization up to several 10,000s of course for this specific system is uh, very efficient. Now, you do the scale, uh, the, the sampling, and in the end, you can look at how much CPU time I have I burned to get my density of water. So you start with a GGA, you need roughly, or we needed roughly 100,000 CPU hours to get the density. Hybrid functionals, depending on how you do it, is a factor of three to 20 in our code, uh, more expensive. Uh, to get the density, and then RPA and MP2 uh, are even more expensive, ty typically 50 to 100 times more than a GGA calculation. So that's what you have to invest to do these type of calculations. Now, what do you get? Here is the, the Monte Carlo profile, or the Monte Carlo cyclist profile of the density, MP2, some oscillations, of course, and fluctuations, but it uh, uh, converges to a density of 1.02. There's one zero too much. It's 1.02 grams per milliliter, so not bad. RPA gives you a uh, slightly different, than, uh, lower density, 0.99 grams per milliliter. So very good results. It seems to be that really this non-local correlation and being, doing everything on the same level is uh, a way to get very good results for these systems. What about the sodium in water? Again, we get a very or a rather different uh, radial distribution function and the peak is now much closer to experiment again. Energy levels in liquid water, they are better Still not perfect. This is certainly something where uh, we don't get away easily with just using MP2 and, and uh, direct RPA. So this was the standard implementation that uh, has been done a couple of years ago, uh, mostly by Maugo. And in uh, recent years, we have made some progress on these codes. First. We have forces and stress tensors for MP2, both restricted and unrestricted. We have also implemented GW. Once you have RPA, the step to GW is not that big. That has been done by Jan Wilhelm uh, in the last couple of years. And very recently, uh, implementations where we reduce the scaling of the RPA and the GW uh, from n to the fourth to n to the th uh, third. Now, some information, how expensive are MP2 forces or RPA forces? These are now non-variational methods, so you really pay for forces. Hmm? Uh, typically, a factor of four. So the force is uh, four times more expensive than the energy in these type of calculations. Uh, it's the same for closed gel and open gel uh, calculations. The uh, additional factor going from closed gel to open gel is roughly a factor of three. You have to do three uh, independent energy terms uh, instead of one in MP2 going from uh, closed to open gel. With this, it was possible to calculate an MD trajectory of water and from the MD trajectory to calculate the infrared spectra of water. So what you here see is the experimental and the MP2 uh, 
uh, infrared spectroscopy calculated from uh, uh, velocity autocorrelation function on an MD, MP2 MD trajectory with some tricks. One of them is that it's scaled by 0.95, that all the quantum chemists will say, of course, MP2 scaling factor for infrared frequency is 0.95, and we also use this. This seems to be a universal uh, law, because MP2 is not the final answer. There are still many uh, types of correlation uh, to be added. The GW code, just to show you, uh, here the scaling with uh, system size, and here the scaling, uh, the parallel scaling with system size. If you look here in this uh, double logarithmic plot, it's also n to the fourth. So GW uh, in, in this implementation is n to the fourth, like the underlying RPA calculation. And roughly the same timing. So these calculations with 20, 20 quasi-particle energies uh, took about, for a system of 64 waters, take about a couple of minutes uh, on a machine of this size here, a few thousand processes. Now, the last and the newest development is a cubic scaling RPA. So here the idea is that we are using another resolution of identity that is no longer uh, based on the Coulomb metric, but now on the overlap metric. Then these integrals can be calculated through this uh, contraction, tensor contraction. The advantage is now that these tensors here, these three index tensors, are overlaps between three different atomic functions, and so they are extremely sparse. Only when all three functions overlap, they are non-zero. So these are extremely sparse quantities here, and we can make use of this sparsity. Uh, what you need is the three center overlaps, the two center overlaps, and you need here the integrals and I forgot to say, of course, whenever I write here an integral, in principle, we, I mean a periodic local function. So it's an atomic function, but it's periodic, fully periodic. That means all these integrals, in fact, these Coulomb integrals, are in fact evolved integrals. And for this type of evolved integrals over at, uh, Gaussian functions, we now have a semi-analytic uh, integration, so we don't do this anymore with Fourier transforms, we directly calculate these integrals analytically. And this gives you a, bi a big speed up for these type of calculations, reducing the prefactor again, not the scaling of the method. So we are using the sparsity of the three center overlap integrals and need an additional trick, that is we are using also uh, now a time, um, or we're going to the time domain, and we are calculating the Q matrix in the uh, direct RPA now in the time domain, or with other words, we're doing a Fourier transform. If you do a Fourier transform, you can separate the energy part here, and you can derive here a quasi-density matrix, or in fact, it's a Green's function, that only depends on the occupied orbitals and one that only depends on the um, uh, unoccupied orbitals. Now, this is the final formula. If you go through it, you make use of all the sparsity. This is cubic scaling. Cubic scaling because in the end you have to calculate the logarithm of this matrix. This matrix, we don't assume it's sparse, so you do a logarithm of a full matrix and that's n cubed. That's where n cubed is coming in. Here is the comparison, the cubic scaling code compared to the linear scaling, roughly 128 waters is the, the break-even point in the current implementation. The interesting thing is also that in fact the cubic part is not yet setting in, and for all of these systems up to 1,000 water molecules, in fact the code is quadratically scaling. 
even better, the quadratically scaling part becomes linear scaling once these density matrices also become sparse. So the only cubic scaling part left is this, working with these matrices, all the rest is in fact becoming linear scaling. The same can be done for GW. So this is now a cubic scaling GW calculation. You also already heard before on, of these nano ribbons. So what Jan, together with the people at EMPA, have done, have, he has calculated these nano ribbons, the, the GW uh, calculations, and you can see here the, for these quasi 2D systems, the scaling is even better, and the break even point is at roughly 100 carbons, and it could uh, go up to 1, 000, uh, nano ribbons with 1,700 carbon atoms. I'm almost finished. Okay, I also almost finished in time. A little bit of outlook and challenges that we have. Basis set convergence, how to calculate properties for these type of uh, functionals, and can we do sustainable code development once we go in these type of complex systems. So basis set convergence, I just wanted to say, if you ask a quantum chemist, he will tell you it's solved. Just use an F12 algorithm. Unfortunately, Nobody ever thought, or I don't know of anybody of thinking of F12 algorithms for RPA and GW, especially not ones that are as low scaling as the implementations we have. Another possibility would be maybe we should go for double hybrids with only long range, not short range, uh, and then the, uh, the basis set convergence is not the problem. The other thing is we need an additional basis set Gaussian basis sets are already something not that easy to handle, especially if you come from a plane wave a community where you have one number and suddenly you have 1,000 different basis sets, which one to pick. And now comes the additional RI basis sets, so what do we do? We can automatically generate RI basis sets, but they are typically two times bigger than the ones that we do by hand for the same accuracy. But maybe it's nice to, uh, to go this way anyway. Uh, CPU time is always there, and um, human time is very valuable. Uh, properties, as I said, derivatives and everything, I mean, we have non-variational wave functions, it's hard to do. And the question is, how do we do properties? Any property a response property is already a second derivative and so on, uh, uh, so we have to do, uh, sorry, second order response. Uh, it's something we have to think about. Uh, also periodic boundary conditions, of course, so for example, how do you calculate the dipole moment of MP2 in periodic boundary conditions? Sustainable code development, because I'm at the end, I can just see everything means increased code complexity. Uh, if you decrease the complexity of your algorithms, you usually increase the complexity of your code. That's uh, something uh, that is almost universal. The same is true also for hardware. The more sophisticated you want to go in your hardware, usually your codes become more and more complex. Something that is difficult to, to be sustainable in the future, uh, I don't know. I don't have a solution for this. So with this, I'm at the end, and I'm happy to take questions. Thank you.